it's really amazing that you can, on your own, discover structure in the world without someone explicitly teaching you. Learning about the structure of data gives you useful representations about the world. We want neural networks to learn initial structures which have wide applicability and to do so on their own without human annotated labels. What many people don't tell you is that supervised learning requires vast amounts of carefully annotated and curated data. Far from freeing up humans to do more meaningful work, it's actually increased the amount of tedious and laborious jobs in many ways. These tasks are even forced on us, the crowd in the form of captures becoming increasingly annoying and time consuming in a vicious feedback loop. It's almost impossible to label everything in the world with every possible useful label. We need orders of magnitude more data and labeling is going to be very expensive. The self-supervised training strategy in Vision so far has been inspired by the approach in natural language processing, which is to say pre-training on a vast amount of training data and then fine-tuning on a target data set. Now, no one would argue that the key ingredient of success in the natural language processing world recently has been the self-supervised pre-training. The pre-training tasks use vast amounts of data available online to create a learning signal. And this scales much better than supervised learning and it doesn't deflate away any of the rich semantic information in the images by projecting onto a single label selected from only a handful of possible categories. Given different representations of the same image, we want to learn a representation space where representations from the same image are close together and at the same time far apart from representations of other images. Incredibly, this simple idea is based on nothing other than similarity. It leads to incredibly powerful representations. Self-supervised learning is rapidly closing the gap with supervised methods on large computer vision benchmarks. Self-supervised learning aims to learn useful or actually even better representations of the input data without having to rely on human annotations. The main reason we use self-supervised learning is that we don't know a priori what tasks we might need to do later. We can get there much faster with fine-tuning than starting again from scratch. Um, Self-supervised learning produces much higher quality representations than supervised learning, right? But these can become somewhat pointillistic once fine-tuning has been completed. Generally speaking though, fine-tuned solutions projected from more general representations learned with self-supervised learning tend to lead to robust predictions and better out-of-sample performance. Now, self-supervised learning is called predictive learning. Right? You allow the machine to generate the supervisory signals out of the data itself. The machine supervision is the process of creating a label, but the human supervision is reduced to the process of selecting suitable data sets and data augmentations. We're still adding prototypical human knowledge into the model via the back door, but with significantly less onus on the humans we're effectively letting the machine itself discover structures and categories by predicting unobserved or hidden relationships, either in time or in space. We see this all over the place. In GPT-3, we take the past and predict the future. In BERT, we predict between known intervals. We're trying to learn the fundamental property of an image that you should be able to recognize irrespective of many common distortions of images. The idea of using data augmentations to vary individual data points and then differentiating all of those variations from other data points is not new by any means. Exemplar networks, for example, cast the representation learning problem as a classification problem with every image in the data set representing its own class. Later, Wu refined the idea, converting it from a parametric to a non-parametric classification by using the data points themselves as classification weights. They also used the idea of noise contrastive estimation from the discipline of learning word vectors and natural language processing. And then SimClear delivered another push in performance by dramatically simplifying the architecture and the data augmentations used. Now, in the early days of 
contrastive self-supervised learning such as FaceNet and SimClear, you had explicit positives and negatives. The models would try to distinguish different augmented images by classifying which image it was. So contrastive learning made the strong assumption that everything else that isn't this particular class is dissimilar. Um, the approach was also quite flawed because um, training a classifier to distinguish between all the possible pairs of images didn't scale very well with the number of images. Uh, SimClear also produced this really cool idea of a projection head where the representations you compare in the objective are not the ones you actually use downstream. This means that you can effectively learn a broad brush similarity but maintain fine-grained representations. The projectors these days have as many parameters as the backbones themselves but um, you can check out the episode that we did with Simon Cornbliff to get more information about SimClear. This is Simon Cornbliff. It's a really interesting question if we just want to turn an image into a vector that we could then train a linear classifier on top of, what is the best way of doing that? The bring your own latent or BYOL method moved away from comparing different images and instead focused on metric learning. Features are trained by comparing them to a momentum encoder and using a much smaller batch size. Although as it turned out, the momentum encoder wasn't even that useful. So what's clear from looking at the self-attention masks is that the self-supervised representations are far richer than the supervised ones, even though the supervised ones typically have slightly better accuracy. Supervised classification is a bit like cheating on an exam by knowing what the questions will be in advance. All the model needs to know is how to pass that particular exam. This is the so-called shortcut rule, where you optimize on a particular metric at the cost of everything else. We already know from the free lunch theorem that such highly specific accuracy comes at the cost of generalization. Self-supervised learning can bypass such specific and narrow objectives that perform well at specific downstream tasks and instead build much more broadly applicable and general purpose representations. Data augmentation is the secret and indeed most important ingredient in making self-supervised learning work so well. The data augmentation that you need for self-supervised learning is different from the data augmentation that you need for supervised learning. When you have contrastive learning, you have this problem, which is that if there's only one dominant feature in your data that can be used to perform the contrastive task, that would be the only feature that the network would ever learn. So with augmentation, you're kind of making the task harder so that the network actually has to learn many different kinds of features. The kind of data augmentations that we do are different for self-supervised learning compared to supervised learning. So for example, aggressive color distortion is really, really important in self-supervised learning. This is because in the self-supervised setting where you're comparing different augmented representations from the same image, it would be easy for the model to overfit on the color histogram instead of learning the richer information. If you think about it, not all dogs have the same color histogram, but in self-supervised learning, all of the individual images will have the same color histogram. Data augmentation also serves as a proxy for what might happen in real life. Imagine we're an agent interacting with the environment. We're going around all of these different places and we see objects in a variety of different circumstances and you know different transformations being applied to our viewpoint. A recurring issue with contrastive self-supervised learning is the existence of trivial constant solutions, otherwise known as mode collapse. Uh, when the model no longer pays attention to the input or converges too quickly with a shortcut solution. Many tricks have been conceived to try and avoid these trivial constant solutions. Um, contrastive uh, methods like SimClear, for example, they defined positive and negative sample pairs, which were treated differently in the loss function. Another idea was using asymmetric learning updates instead of a Siamese network, uh, momentum encoding the second network, which is to say setting its weights to be a kind of exponentially moving average uh, of the weights of the other model. Dr. Ishan Misra is a research scientist at Facebook AI Research, where he works on computer vision and machine learning. His main research interest is reducing the need for human supervision throughout self-supervised learning and indeed reducing the need for human knowledge in general in visual learning systems. 
During his PhD, Ishan worked on a self-supervised representation learning algorithm called Shuffle and Learn in about 2016, and it learned the features automatically um, from frames which were captured in the wrong order, and you know the algorithm had to um, shuffle them into the correct order, but it was a self-supervised representation learning algorithm. So Ishan's model even learned really, really good representations for humans and outperformed supervised ImageNet features on pose estimation. While ImageNet has many images, it doesn't contain pixel level labels for human pose, which made it hard for supervised uh, features to generalize. So this was a completely unexpected and surprising result. And Ishan realized that self-supervised learning could shine for some tasks where supervised learning struggled, essentially. So he realized that self-supervised learning could easily capture signals and information that was difficult to capture with supervised learning because these signals were just hard to label. Ishan also believes that the way that we design self-supervised learning architectures encodes an incredible amount of information about the domain. For domain agnostic architectures like multi-layer perceptrons or transformers, the inductive biases are encoded through our data and data pre-processing steps. We want the representations to be roughly the same no matter which input transformation was applied to the image, but we design the set of input transformations applied to the image and this encodes which transforms are important or irrelevant to image recognition. Using such a weak encoding of human knowledge results in models that can learn representations over all modalities, vision, audio, 3D and point clouds. Ishan realized that the exact loss function doesn't even matter as much, right? It could be contrastive or clustering or self-distillation or redundancy reduction or compression. Um, if you'd have asked Ishan about this three years ago, he wouldn't have believed this to be such an overarching empirical observation. Now, we asked Ishan about going beyond representations and learning universal categories for objects in artificial intelligence. And he thinks that categories are task and knowledge and context dependent. Without these, it's almost impossible to discover them. By the way, the, the AVID video paper that Ishan mentioned in the talk today is a best paper candidate at CVPR 21 that was just announced over the weekend. So congratulations to Ishan. There's been a cluster of work in the vision space actually recently. Facebook AI Research, so Ishan and, and his wider team, they've released three papers called Dino, Barlow Twins and Pause. Um, they are very, very important papers in self-supervised contrastive learning. Let's talk about Dino. Transformers models are computationally more demanding. They require more data and so far haven't exhibited any unique properties compared to ConvNets until Dino until now. Dino explores whether pure self-supervised learning adds anything to Transformers vision models distinct from ConvNets. So Dino means self-distillation without labels. It's a system for unsupervised pre-training of vision models, including vision transformers. It's non-contrastive, so it compares two representations from the same image, and the authors discovered that momentum encoders are a cheap way to build a teacher model. Now, it takes a lot of inspiration from the BYOL, or Bring Your Own Latent Paper, and the key finding is that self-supervised VIT with this learning framework discovers object boundaries accessible from the self-attention layer of the last block, totally unsupervised. The results are way better using the Transformers backend, and apparently even better than supervised ResNets with a linear activation layer. They're almost nearly as good as uh, supervised ResNets, 100% unsupervised, so um, you know, using a K nearest neighbor approach on the unsupervised representations. So the mode collapse on this is avoided with the sharpening and the centering on the teacher representations, which encourages them to be different and harder to learn. I remember when we spoke to Simon Cornbliffe that he told us that the, um, you know, the Sim CLR guy, he said he had no idea why architectures like this uh, wouldn't collapse. He thought that there must be some dynamics in neural network architectures that we just don't understand yet. Let's talk about pause. So pause is all about self-supervised learning. So that's using less label data. Uh, it's been a long-standing challenge in machine learning to be more sample efficient. So in pause, you take unlabeled samples, and you take a batch of stratified labeled samples, and then you try to predict the similarity of the representations between the two sets. Pause extends the distance metric loss using self-supervised methods like bring your own latent and SWAV to the semi-supervised setting. Now, uh, it goes about saying that pause delivers state-of-the-art results 
using much less compute. When pre-training a standard ResNet 50 model with pause, using just 1% of the labels in ImageNet, they got state-of-the-art accuracy while doing 10 times fewer pre-training steps. And finally, let's talk about Barlow Twins. Barlow Twins reduces the redundancy, which is the opposite of mutual information, between the representations, which is to say minimizing the true cross-correlation matrix and the observed cross-correlation matrix. It doesn't need asymmetric learning updates, and it doesn't need a large amount of negative samples, and it can work with smaller batch sizes. The top one accuracy on ImageNet for classification, which is after adding a linear layer, is comparable to state-of-the-art models. Ishan and Yan LeCun recently released a blog post called Self-Supervised Learning, The Dark Matter of Intelligence. The article makes a strong argument that common sense is like the dark matter of the universe, and indeed, its most important feature. Their hypothesis is that self-supervised learning is one of the most promising ways to build up this background knowledge. They make some really interesting observations about language versus vision as well. So vision is much higher dimensional and harder to represent uncertainty. In language, you only have about 50,000 known tokens to deal with, right? Um, they actually created a really cool graphic to illustrate this. They identified the problems of dimensionality, uncertainty, and discrete versus continuous. Now, self-supervised image representation learning scores pretty high on all three of those problems. They propose latent predictive models, which predicts the set on a latent manifold as a stochastic input to a discriminator model. They think that this could be used to build the kind of uncertainty quantification into vision models, which we've been enjoying all of this time in NLP models. Anyway, enjoy the show, folks. Welcome back to the Machine Learning Street Talk YouTube channel and podcast with me, Dr. Tim Scarf, Dr. Yannick Lightspeed Kilcher, and Syak, the Neural Network Pruner Pool. Now, today we have a very, very exciting episode. We have Dr. Ishan Misra, who is a research scientist at Facebook AI Research, where he works on computer vision and machine learning. His main research interests are reducing the need for human supervision and indeed human knowledge in vision learning systems. Now, he completed his PhD at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon. He's done stints at Microsoft Research, INRIA, and Yale. His bachelor's is in computer science, where he achieved the highest GPA in his cohort. Now, Ishan is fast becoming a prolific scientist. He's already been cited more than 3,000 times, and he's co-authored several articles with Jan LeCun, the godfather of deep learning. His most highly cited paper is Cross-Stitch Networks for Multitask Learning, which was in 2016. Now, today, though, we're going to be focusing on an exciting cluster of recent papers around unsupervised representation learning for computer vision. And most of those papers have come from uh, FAIR, Facebook AI Research. Now, these papers are Dino, Emerging Properties in Self-Supervised Vision Transformers, Barlow Twins, self-supervised learning via redundancy reduction and pause semi-supervised learning of visual features by non-parametrically predicting view assignments with support samples now all of these papers are completely hot off the press if you look at the dates on the papers they say uh, around may 2021 so um, they've just officially been released and many of you will remember Perl, by the way, which was self-supervised learning of pretext invariant representations, which Ishan was the primary author of in 2019. Now, recently, Ishan has also been diversifying, if you like. He's been getting into video with Avid, audiovisual instance discrimination with cross-modal agreement, and also deep learning on point clouds with his paper, Depth Contrast, Self-Supervised Pre-Training of 3D Features on Any Point Cloud. Now, he's also wrote this very famous article of Jan LeCun recently, which is, you know, the, the dark matter of the universe piece. And uh, we'll certainly be talking about that. Now, Ishan is a passionate believer in self-supervised representation learning. Um, Ishan, you've told us that you totally underestimated the power of multimodal learning, right? And, uh, you know, you want to get rid of as much human yeah. knowledge um, as possible from these machine learning models. So anyway, um, Ishan, it's, it's an absolute honor to have you on the show. Welcome. And can you give us a short roundup of some of the key kind of ideas and vision models that have happened over the last couple of years? So first, uh, thanks a lot for having me, Tim, Yannick, and Sayak. 
it's amazing. I actually listen to your podcast and watch your YouTube channel. So it's actually pretty thrilling to be on it. Uh, so, okay. In terms of uh, what are the big things, what uh, like kind of uh, made me really wonder what am I doing and why am I doing it? Uh, it's so for me, I think self supervised learning is really very, very interesting. So there are multiple like layers to this to understand why it is interesting. So from a purely scientific perspective, let's let's forget anything to do with practicality. It's just amazing that you can discover some kind of structure or knowledge in the world uh, without someone telling you because our world is structured. Animals are able to navigate it. Even single celled amoeboids are able to na navigate it. So there is some hidden structure. So of course, it is like interesting at a pure scientific level. And for me, uh, the sort of practical level uh, interest actually comes from just Annotations are really expensive. A lot of the times we don't even know what to annotate. So even if we think that, you know, we want someone to tell us, say, what is a you know, person? People have very different definitions for like even drawing that on a particular image. Some people want to draw a box. Some people want to draw masks. So if, if we can't even agree on what it means to sort of annotate a person and we are people, uh, that sort of tells you a fundamental limitation with annotation itself. Uh, People don't know what granularity we're supposed to get it at, at what granular, granularity are we supposed to even express it at. So there is that sort of, an, uh, that sort of a uh, shortcoming with annotation as well. And so for me, it's really important that we uh, try to like get away from these set, sort of artificial constructs like bounding boxes. That's just like seems very weird. Why should it be axis aligned? Why should it be like rectangular? Most objects aren't even rectangular in nature. Uh, so why is like this particular form of supervision even important? Uh, and we really try to let models learn and discover things which are useful. Maybe boxes are useful. In that case, the model should discover it. Maybe boxes are not useful at all. In that case, the model learns to ignore it completely. Yeah. So maybe go, going a bit further than, you know, we don't know what, you know, what we should even label and so on. We also don't know what tasks we would want to do. And, uh, I have been always surprised by how well these unsupervised models then go ahead and solve the different the different tasks. What does 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 that tell you something more fundamental about is that a property of the methods we use to do self-supervised training? Is that a property of the tasks we throw at it or is there some fundamental thing in in the universe? Like what what's your opinion on kind of why why does this not only, you know, do we learn good representations but it actually goes and, and solves these tasks way better so i think a lot of it really has to do with the fact especially for vision so all of my like conversations and examples are always going to be vision focused that's what i work in so uh sorry for like all the nlp and other folks out there uh anyway so for me personally i think the reason is that pixels are very structured uh and whenever we sort of learn that the, for example a model that is invariant to augmentation what we're instilling in the model is no matter the lighting, no matter the cropping, no matter sort of all sorts of weird things I can change about the image. What is the one fundamental property of this image that you should be able to recognize? And that is the identity of a cat or the identity of this particular object in the image. And so it's very natural that it works really well for object classification or image recognition tasks or object detection kind of tasks. So it's, I mean, Honestly, I was pretty surprised and I do think data augmentation is something which was uh, considered as, oh, you know, it's a hack. Uh, let's just like augment the model, make it more robust. It's a regularization thing. And now it's really the sort of secret ingredient that's making self-supervised learning work. So it's no longer something that you do to prevent overfitting. It's really the core learning signal of your model. Do you think we should follow Sutton's argument, right, and try and eschew all the human knowledge in ML systems? Microsoft has recently started making noises about a new paradigm, by the way, called machine teaching, which does the complete opposite of what Sutton wants to do. It, you know, it bakes as much human knowledge as possible into the architecture and training regime. And apparently it massively improves the sample efficiency and robustness and reduces complexity. But, you know, there's always this question of um, maybe we're not learning it in the best possible way or not learning representations that generalize. So, um, the question is, you know, why is human knowledge so despised in the ML community? 
um, I thought the poet algorithm was quite cool because that actually um, learned curriculums that were better than any human designed ones. And presumably that's quite a cool, um, you know, thing that could generalize. So um, if we wanted to design the optimal policy for a closed ended domain like Pac-Man, for example, you know, in that situation, it seems like a human designed curriculum is the way to go. But this brings us full circle to vision algorithms. So presumably you would agree that a pure play unsupervised approach to learning would yield higher quality representations. But clearly the, the compute time would increase exponentially and the problem itself might entail deception and might be harder. So I think we agree that the two main sources of human knowledge in vision architectures at the moment are the, the, the data that we're showing the algorithms and the data augmentations. Do you want to get rid of them? Uh, not necessarily. So I think uh, this question is fairly loaded, right? So if I want to solve a particular task, I only I have a company that uh, my company's only thing is to recognize different types of cats. Then I think you, I mean, practically just label all the cats you can. That's basically probably going to be the best use of your money and resources. Uh, please don't attempt to do self-supervised learning just for like doing this because you have a particular domain and you're trying to solve a particular task. I think the reason self-supervised learning is interesting is because we don't a priori know the end tasks that we're going to go for. We do not know all the possible categories that we want to recognize. And so that's the reason we want to do this sort of task independent or as free from bias sort of uh, learning as possible. And so human knowledge is not necessarily despised. It's more so that it's a limitation for us. So say I decide to create a data set where I think I imagine that this is possibly all the visual information you will need. I create that data set. I'm sure you can find pathological cases in the particular data set that I created, which, which makes it unsuitable for your particular downstream task. Uh, so in just in that case, I think it's just not that we despise human knowledge. We do think there are limitations to it. And so as long as uh, we can sort of design models that are relying on as less human knowledge as possible, that's pretty exciting, like scientifically and also from a practical perspective, because now they can actually go do tasks we never thought they would. Uh, so I think that's the sort of uh, line I draw. I'm not averse to using human knowledge at all. In fact, like if I were to start a company to recognize cats, believe me, I'm not doing self-supervised learning there. It, it, it always seems a bit tricky to me in that, uh, you know, this removal of human knowledge, because what, what I see is humans very carefully going and designing not the labels in this case, but the augmentations, right? So we, we like we know you know cropping for for images seems to be like one of the the super augmentations like one of the most effective ones but also this kind of lighting change maybe rotations and so on essentially what we're telling the model is you know all of these things are the same however all of the things that we don't do are not the same so the, the model doesn't only recognize the identity of that cat on the image but if we, for some reason, forget an augmentation, right? There, there are countless augmentations that we didn't think of yet. It, essentially, we're also telling the model, you know, all of that is the same. Um, isn't isn't self-supervised learning sort of bringing in human knowledge through the back door a little bit via how we design these augmentations? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that is the sort of cheat. I mean, actually, there are two types of cheats. Uh, one is the models themselves, right? So like when, when, when using ConNets, like a particular architecture, like say ResNet 50, ResNet 50 was really engineered by human knowledge. So of course, there is like enough human knowledge and inductive bias in that model category. Even if you take a transformer, it's operating, say the WIT model, it's operating on a 16 cross 16 patch. So someone had to sit and design that too. Uh, so there is human knowledge injected through that. There is human knowledge injected through the augmentations. Uh, through the loss function. So yes, we are injecting, but it's, I would argue it's a fairly milder sort of form of knowledge than say designing an entire WordNet hierarchy and saying this particular dog is a Yorkshire Terrier. This particular dog is a Boston Terrier. So even though they share the name Terrier and visually look nothing alike, now we're basically distinguishing based on cert certain uh, aspects on a particular ontology or categorization. But uh, coming to your point on augmentations uh, and designing them, I'm not a fan of it. It works. Uh, but I think it actually points to a slightly different problem in computer vision, which is that we're training these sort of really passive agents. So our agents are like basically couch potatoes and you just throw a bunch of images at it. Uh, and so, of course, now we need to augment things and like do all this careful stuff. Possibly if we could move to agents that are actually able to navigate the world, 
and observe the world uh, at time they can probably incorporate lighting changes so if you observe a tree if you observe it in the fall during day at night and so on you automatically get those data augmentations for free and the cropping and so on actually happens as you move your camera or sensor around so i would say it's like a very poor proxy for doing that because right now we aren't like we're solving one problem at a time uh, but it seems that it's not that unnatural to do because possibly a real agent could also simulate these things or actually get these things for free from real data could, could could you articulate what you think the essence of these augmentations are now some some of them have been designed in a principled way and dare i say some of them it's a bit of trial and error we've tried different things and what they seem to be doing is that there are certain statistical regularities to this data and it's but it's not like we're learning the regularities of the data it's more like we are learning regularities in um the kind of transformations or distortions that we're likely to see so we're we're kind of saying um you know this is the principle of we want information to be cast in slightly different ways in experience space and we're getting the models to learn something fundamental about that so what what do you think those augmentations are doing from a knowledge point of view so i think it's uh, in some way sort of disentangling so when you look at an image uh, just a single image it's really hard to understand what object boundaries are what particular texture is or what shape of the object is and so on it's very hard to disentangle these things we have probably a better understanding for things because we've moved around our entire lives we've observed things from different viewpoints now when you sort of keep sort of adding these types of augmentations boundaries are sort of more likely to emerge out better so if you were to change lighting of things sharp boundaries or sharp edges actually emerge out far better uh, so i think it basically helps you understand like delineate objects or delineate different types of objects or delineate different parts of objects much better because we don't have like from a single view 2d it's really hard to say things right there are just pathological projections of the 3d world that you can get onto an image where you cannot delineate different types of objects uh, and so this data augmentation is really sort of being a proxy for all of those things again like i said it's not the best thing to do but it works really well and yes we engineer it a whole lot um, to make it work Uh, about your point on sort of being passive and active agent so one argument and also one observation is that particularly self supervised models in vision or in even nlp or any other data modality they are extremely data hungry they tend to be more data hungry than the supervised models of course because they do not have access to readily available discriminative signals right so so let's say if we wanted to make some efforts to make them less data hungry one could argue that hey my model has got only access to the data but we as human beings we have access to all kinds of happenings that are there in our lives right uh, so often it's argued that self supervised models tend to you know learn some kind of representation about the world or tend to develop some kind of knowledge about the whole world but in order to make that happen it needs to have access to a whole lot of data set like seer from facebook ai research it was trained on around if my memory is giving correct results 1 billion images right that's a whole lot of images so so my point is when we are saying that it it is sort of developing some understanding of the world or the knowledge around it across you know different regularities what are we exactly meaning here because no one told me how to you know develop an abstract representation of a banana or any object but i developed that abstraction inside my brain after just seeing it no one you know instilled that particular prior inside me so for in terms of making things uh, more efficient for data i think it just depends on our modeling our modeling hasn't really reached that level yet we are essentially like yanek and tim have also mentioned taking different augmentations and just trying to put the features together it's a very weak form of signal honestly that is also one of the reasons and we don't really know like the augmentations that we're doing are not that powerful so they can't for example model 3d viewpoints so essentially we're relying on a lot of images to get uh, the richer set of uh, augmentations that we have to get um, and so that's one of the main reasons why we need a lot of images um, the other sort of problem you can also see is that 
there is a sharp sort of uh, break off point. So es- especially in images, you can increase the data by a whole lot, but the gains start to diminish far quickly compared to supervised learning. So we actually observe that in the SEER model as well. So we train with a billion images. Uh, but if you look at the paper as well, basically the gains that you start getting at that billion scale are actually uh, not as much uh, compared to supervised learning. And I think that's, again, that's sort of pointing to the modeling problem in uh, our current methods. Uh, most of these methods are relying on this augmentation consistency, which is a very weak form of signal. And well, when once you're looking at a billion images, uh, you are getting a lot of data augmentation kind of for free. So now this signal is really like sort of diminished at that scale. Uh, so I think, yes. Uh, I, I took Syak's si question to be more along the lines of um, kind of interpolation versus extrapolation or conceptual generalization, I suppose I, I would say. I, mean, I, I often point to the clip model, right? Because that seemed to be capable of what you might call abstract or conceptual generalization. It, it, it seems to be able to recognize a cartoon picture of a banana as being the same as a real banana, right? So um, neural networks that uh, Cholet was telling right. us that they only, ex- you know, they, they generalize through interpolation on some learned smooth manifold. But the kicker is that if statistical regularities and smooth manifolds in the latent space don't exist, then the neural networks can only kind of memorize your, your data. So, you know, is there a smooth monolithic manifold which exists between the distributions of cartoon bananas and real bananas? I, I think not. Right. So um, presumably in clip, it's the human generated annotation that provides the link between the banana manifolds and the banana token. It's not actually performing that. Uh, you know, I, I played a clip from Douglas Hofstadter on the last show, and, and he says that, you know, intelligence is the ability to create these abstract analogies. So I could say to you, well, my brain is a little bit like the New York subway system. I'm making all these connections all over the place. And, and I've just created that analogy. So um, I, I, I think do you think that these neural networks will ever be able to have that level of conceptualization? I think it's really hard. I do think the sort of problem of, rec- like, there's a separate problem of recognition, there's a separate problem of naming things. And I think naming is where things become really tricky. Because if you can think, like, I mean, there are languages where you see that, uh, the like, basically there are 100 different types of words for snow. Whereas you, we have like in English, maybe a certain word for snow. So I think naming just becomes really, really hard. Uh, so it's very hard for us to understand and probe and see what this model has learned and whether it has really learned the right abstraction. Because the right abstraction is, again, a human defined concept, varies from culture to culture, varies from person to person. And I think that again, sort of uh, comes back to a fundamental sort of drawback with human, uh, like whenever we try to interpret things, we add our own bias into the model. And whereas the model is like model is very simply just trying to learn pixel correlations or very simply just trying to understand which pixels matter, which pixels don't. Uh, and now we can inject our own bias and interpret it as saying that, oh, it's not learned that this cartoon banana is the same as this banana. But is it really? Is the cartoon banana the same? I can't eat it. I can eat the other banana. So should they exactly be the same category? Or should I actually have a separate category called cartoon banana? So... It's it's like the essence, though, isn't it? But this is a, this is a fascinating philosophical question, is, is because human beings that we do all have this abstract concept of of a banana. But let, let's let's take this a step further. So you you made a strong argument in your recent article with Jan Lacoon that common sense knowledge is like the dark matter of the universe, right? It's it's everywhere, and indeed the most important feature of intelligence. Now I think everyone would agree with that. I think that's actually beautiful. Um, now we were speaking to Gary Marcus last week, you know, and, and connectionists and symbolists would, of course, argue on the nature and the substrate of this knowledge and the extent to which it's learnable. Because I noticed that in a lot of the material from Facebook, you know, that uh, learning and, and knowledge is is kind of conflated together. So. I, I don't think symbolists would have a problem with this notion of vectors as the substrate or even progressive learning. I think what they're picking up on is the fact that, and what we what Sayek was saying as well, is that some knowledge isn't in the data, right? You have you have to perform reasoning, right? So, for example, could we learn from data that the best time complexity of sorting is n log n? Because because that that's a fact, you know. Um, so these people would argue that this type of knowledge is acquired; it's either discovered or we do some deductive reasoning or whatever. So, do you think there are limits to the kind of knowledge which can be learned from data? Yes, I mean, so for example, like complexity theory, uh, I don't think that's going to pop out. Uh, we can do as much self-supervised learning. I don't think it'll pop out in the next fifty years, maybe hundred years, but I won't be around then, so it's okay. Uh, 
So, but I don't think it'll happen in the next 50 years for sure. The the kind of knowledge that is going to pop out, uh, or at least seems more more and more likely, is going to be one at least in vision. I think is going to be one that is uh, sort of least tied to language. So it is kind of loosely tied to, tied to language because because I think language in itself is such a high level co- construct that uh, it allows us to abstract away a lot of the details. It allows us to really sort of think at and basically like conveying that sorting example. It was it you can't com- convey it in terms of pictures. You can't write a picture for it which can like you know can like work all the way. Whereas I think what our vision models are really trying to do is sort of learn knowledge that is kind of independent of language. Kind of what you would be able to get, I would be able to get, even if we both did not speak English. Uh, so I do think like that's the sort of limit right now. Uh, and until we inject that abstraction that actually comes through language, maybe, uh, and that's what like clip-like models do, or maybe where we have now sort of joint learning happening across vision and language, maybe that's when more complex kind of knowledge will actually start to pop out. Clip hasn't acquired that. Not We've told Clip. So there is a human data point which has told Clip that those things are an abstract category. Do, do you think we could make the models actually acquire those categories? I don't think so, because I don't think there are universal right. categories. I So in my PhD, I used to actually think there are universal categories. And one of the people I used to interact with a lot is Alyosha Efros at Berkeley. Uh, and he has this like really strong philosophy that, you know, categories don't exist. If categories exist, then there should be a category basically for potato and vodka because potato and vodka basically are the same thing. And that sounds absurd. And basically, I used to always think, why is he saying that? And I never got it. Up until very recently, I think maybe a couple of years ago, I've become very convinced that this notion of categories is really hard for everyone. Uh, it's it's so context dependent that it's impossible. I think the simplest category, I can find pathological cases for it which, where it basically does not make any sense. So I'm going to go back to the banana example because I really like it. Uh, so let's go back to that one. So if you're a hungry person, you really care about the difference between a banana and a cartoon banana. Because at that point, you would be pretty angry if someone told you, hey, it's a cartoon banana and then basically sends you a, like a flat a cartoon banana printed on a sheet and then you can't eat it. Uh, so it really depends on what we want to do with it. So categories, I think, are so task and knowledge, like sort of, uh, context dependent that until we inject in some way context or task it's really hard for us to discover those things yeah i think it's also analogous to the uh, way self-supervision relaxes problem spaces you know when we are doing supervised learning we are injecting that discriminative signal inside of our model i i guess that is somehow bounding our models to be restrictive to, to that discriminative signal only but when it comes to self-supervision, the model has more freedom. It has more leeway to allow itself to, you know, learn representations that make two images truly different from each other. So I guess in some sense, I would argue that, you know, having this form of, you know, learning objectives also relaxes the problem spaces a bit. I mean, coming back a little bit to why these things actually then work, it always astounds me because Essentially, so the the way we do vision self-supervision right now is, as you said, by identity, right? We we augment the same image a little bit, and then we teach the network that that's actually the same image. And sometimes we teach it that it's not all of these other images, uh, and sometimes that's implicit. The, the fact that still from this emerges a representation that can categorize, right? So, so some, somehow this gives yet a good, a good signal that clusters together, say, all of the cats in the data set or all of the dogs, even though the model has never learned that these two things are actually the sa- like a dog. The model has only learned, well, this is the same and this is the same. Do, do you think, like, what's the... Is, is it really the augmentations? Are we as humans really that well able to augment away everything else or is there something else at play here like why why do we what makes all the cats go together even though we never told the the model to do that so i think it's the inductive bias in the model itself Mm -hmm. so we can run a fairly straightforward experiment to verify this Um, and it that's actually what inspired a lot of the work uh, we did so you can take a randomly initialized continent 
and you can basically feed in two pictures of a cat and one picture of a dog and at pure random initialization the convnet already knows that the similarity between the two cat pictures is higher than the dog picture mm-hmm. that tells us basically there is enough inductive bias in that random model itself so all we are doing is basically bootstrapping it by data augmentation the same thing actually happens for a vision transformer too in fact it happens for any sort of fairly complicated projection uh, like you know random projection of that particular input that two things that look visually similar are and are basically going to be similar in that even uninitialized sort of random feature space so it's not that surprising i think where things get very tricky is uh, that's where like cat- like when you introduce like pathological categories you you can easily break this system right you have like these two types of dogs which only differ in basically the distance between their eyes and their nose and okay at that level basically i think it's just really hard for these models to mm-hmm. work but figuring out like things which look very distinct just in the like in the sort of pixel space uh and i think even a child can tell basically a lot of these things apart without even necessarily learning like the words cat or dog mm-hmm. and i think the model is good because fundamentally there is that structure in the data and now like as researchers as machine learning researchers we just cheat a little bit on it uh, by like baking that into our model in in terms of its inductive bias and baking that in terms of its data augmentations uh, but you can see that all fine like for any sort of a self supervised model when trained like especially in vision is not really useful for much right so yes let's let's take a billion images let's train that model we have a feature now what it can't name things it can't tell you this is a banana it can never associate that stuff with language at all all it can tell you is these two pictures are similar that's all it can really do i'm just trying to get my head around this because because you started off by saying that these these universal you know discrete categories don't exist but what we get from one of the you know so, so this representation that we've learned it is has some interesting properties it's a vector representation and it's monolithic as well and it does seem to have some kind of universality it does have very broad applicability to lots of downstream tasks right but as you were just saying is it really semantics because because it's so strongly influenced by the data and on instagram you know it learns a lot about salient objects in an image but on instagram most of the images are of things right and and as you say the inductive priors very quickly lead towards certain recognition of statistical regularities and so on so if it is a kind of representation what kind of representation is it we're learning a representation here and in an ideal world it would have semantics but i think we all agree that there's a slight gap so what is it that we're learning it has semantics it's just not like the kind of language induced semantics that we want it's a it's semantics of similarity in some way it's semantics of uh, it's it's basically telling you these two things are visually similar and these two things are not visually similar that's it it's a fairly weak kind of semantic uh, it's that we need to now attach like language to it to be be able to communicate results with one another because i can't like i can't communicate results in a paper saying that hey my model is better at saying that these two pairs of images are better are more similar than you know these three so now i am forced to basically use categories or to use some kind of like structure or a particular task like detection to be able to convey my result to be able to quantitatively measure it uh, but i think this uh, i don't know if it's really like strong semantics because semantics in itself is an overloaded term but it is this i think it is just similarity but I, i think yanik was saying though that yeah it is just similarity but when you look at let's say a tisney projection or or you you look at in the dino paper when you were just looking at the um the 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 self attention map it seems to be doing something incredible right but all of this is just drawn from an inductive prior and looking at the similarities between images so how how could it learn essentially a, an amazing proxy for real life semantics based on that because i mean our categories were not arbitrarily defined uh, i think that's the reason right we designed like a lot of the categories were designed because things looked similar uh, we designed this category of like two a lot of the times things which look similar are kind of named similarly or are belong to the same whatever meta category in our head uh, so if you think about it if you learn pixel correlations really well and if you learn that okay i'm supposed to really ignore the exact color all i need to care about is like you know roughly the shape of it or roughly the color of it you can it's not it's not that hard to imagine that these models can learn it uh, i think the more surprising part for us uh, has been that it can do this like just based on 
I mean, just based on pure data augmentation. I had always thought that you needed active agents to do this and we could not design data augmentations that well. Uh, but I think like as a community, we've really successfully designed amazing data augmentations. Uh, Tim, Tim touched on an important point, I think, and that is if you look at something like 1 billion images scraped from the internet, they're not, they're not sort of random. Like they're, they're not, they're not a, a random walk on the outside and then snapping pictures, right? A lot of pictures on the internet are of people, of things, of places of interest and so on. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very biased sample of you know how these or also the standard data sets how they come to be they mostly have like an object in the middle or something how what what do we know about how important sort of that aspect of the data is like what what would what would hap what would happen if we actually had like a random walk of pictures in the world would it work the same or similar or what do you think about sort of what's the effect of that you will break the system. Good, good way to break the system. I think. <laughs> I think so. It is. It is the bias, right? If you, if I just snap pictures of my wall and I basically have close-ups of my wall and I basically build a data set like that, it's going to be really hard to learn anything meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is like ImageNet, uh, uh, like a lot of Instagram images are very object-centric. People want to show the, you know, the best latte art that they made in the morning or something like that. It's very focused on that particular object. Uh, and so, yes, a lot of the augmentations we design are really kind of overfit to ImageNet or kind of overfit to like these object centric images. Uh, and yeah, that is like, the, I would say, the hidden source of uh, another sort of hidden source of human injection into these models. These are not completely random pictures. If you took completely random pictures, a lot of them would not contain anything interesting and probably serve to like distract the model or focus on like completely spurious statistics. Uh, because now you augment the white wall in different ways yeah. and you want it to become the white wall, which could be, and it should be different from a white table, uh, which could really lead to like very weird things. There's a huge continuum of human knowledge because uh, I watched Yannick's video on, on Dino the other day and, and he said at the end, well, presumably the best thing we could possibly do is get rid of the data augmentations and the, the multi-crop uh, and and possibly, as as Yannick was just saying, may, what what if we just... We didn't even use human captured um, photos and so on. So if, if you could imagine a hypothetical world where we could remove the augmentations and we could have a complete uniform selection over all of the photos, presumably it would be almost impossible to train such a system. But if we could train it, would the representations be even better still? Well, this is... Uh, okay, so I think very hard question. Uh, the one thing is basically, okay, you can remove data augmentations. Uh, I'm not sure exactly, like the current m learning methods are so like hinged upon data augmentation that maybe like none of them apply, but say if, like someone who's extremely smart also figures that out, so great. I think it should work in theory better because now like one of the fundamental problems with designing data augmentation is again, we, we are humans, we have our own flaws, we have our own biases in designing these augmentations. And the real world is what we're trying to imitate. So why not just learn from the real world? Why not learn from that entire continuum? So you get multi-view, like sort of 3D uh, augmentations for free, like amazing types of augmentations, which we can't even think of. But even if you do that, so even if we, if someone figures it out and maybe has today already, I think the problem is our evaluations won't even show that. Uh, so if you have a, something that is working extremely well, until it like you know does something on ImageNet or on categorizing different types of dogs, people at least like a lot of people do not pay attention to it. So I think to get to that stage to develop that, we also need to simultaneously uh, advance our like recognition uh, of these sort of works and evaluation of these works and how what do we really want to use these vision systems for? What are these generalist systems going to be used for? Right, because on on Dino you you had an intuition that the representations were much better. And that was when when you looked at supervised representations, looking at the kind of um, you know the, the self attention matrix or the activation plot. It looked very pointillistic, but the representations um, from Dino looked like you were learning far richer semantic information. 
but but that wasn't that wasn't yeah. something that you quantitatively measured it was just obvious looking at the activation map but i, I was going to ask actually a question between pause and dino on the quality of representations because um you said that pause has uh well in the paper it says it has similarities with bring your own latent and swav but it's a semi-supervised setting right so pause can deliver state-of-the-art results using much less compute and about 10 times fewer pre-training steps and only about one percent of the labels of ImageNet so it's kind of like a hybrid let's use some labels and um, you know there's there's a bit of a conflict right so on the one hand self-supervised um, uh, learning produces better representations but on the other hand this sample efficiency is much lower so pause is really compute and data efficient but are the representations of the pause network is that worse than Dino? Um. Okay, so hard to say a priori. I don't think we have like quantitative numbers to show this. I can just like guess because they both also use different architectures. Like uh, pause used as net models. Uh, Dino actually was primarily focused on the vision transformer model. I don't think fundamentally there is anything that stops a pause like model from ha ha achieving uh, better representations than a purely self supervised model. Uh, I don't think there is any fundamental limitation there. I do think actually. So from a, like a pure practical perspective, a semi-supervised approach is probably what where you would place your bet on. Because anyway, we are using a lot of this like ImageNet bias or a lot of this human-centric bias anyway. So if you're kind of doing this cheating, might as well like basically just put the label right there, right? Uh, so I would say that's a more sort of pragmatic approach. And uh, it's a more sort of upfront using supervision explicitly showing that we are doing it. Um, whereas a lot of the current self-supervised method is injecting human knowledge and like capturing data set bias, but not like explicitly showing that we're doing that. Uh, for something like pause, the sample efficiency argument is the strongest one. It is the fact that you can get away with 10% labeled image net or 1% labeled image net and still achieve fairly strong results. And in that case, it is really sort of, uh, if we were to like now scale up to larger set of concepts, larger set of data, that is probably an approach that would scale far better. Is this a fundamental trade-off though? Because all, the, all of the argument for, I mean, Max Welling does loads of stuff with inductive biases and loads of people are adding human knowledge to machine learning. The, the big argument to do that is better sample efficiency. And as you say, then, then you can train on, on more data. But there is this fundamental philosophical thing about... Um, are we damaging the quality of the representations? Because there's the shortcut rule, right? You get exactly what you optimize for at the expense of everything else. And it's, I don't know whether it's like a dimmer switch. You know, if you if you just have one percent of the labels in there, are you are you kind of ruining it a little bit, or or, or does that somehow not be a, be an issue? Mm. I think a little bit for sure. I mean, uh, it as you increase the amount of data, you are making it more and more task specific and probably it makes it harder and harder to move away from tasks which are not image net specific. So there is that trade-off for sure. Uh, it's just that I think human knowledge in moderation is good. How about we call it like moderately supervised learning, not fully supervised, not self-supervised, but like moderately supervised learning. And we everything in moderation is good. Everything in extremes is probably bad. So maybe in this case, it applies as well. Can you tell us a little bit, I mean, Back to the billion images, because I'm fascinated by large data sets. Now, a billion images is a lot. But if you're, if you're Facebook, I mean, technically, you could get many more images, right? I guess. I, I've actually haven't done the math on that. But I, I'm, just, I'm just guessing. Could you, I don't know how you involved you were or how much knowledge you have about the creation of, of that data set. But could you, do you have any insights in if you do self-supervised learning, how important is the quality of data that you, you get? So is it always better, since you don't have labels, is it always better to just get more data? Or what are the, what's sort of the level of quality control you have to apply when collecting data for self-supervised learning? Right. So for SEER, like the billion scale uh, self-supervised model, there was no quality control. It was actually random images. Uh, that was an explicit design decision because the point of the paper was to test something which was not curated. It was really random images, like it could be cartoon, it could be like blank pictures, it could be like just a green square box, and that's fine. We did not filter anything. So I think the problem actually happens because, and that's actually again where we see the problem of human inductive bias. Because our, all our augmentations are really designed for ImageNet or like these object-centric images, 
they don't transfer very well to these kind of random images so yes as because that part of the model is fixed the objective function the architecture the data augmentation and all of these three are in some way or the other kind of overfit to object centric images it does matter a little bit the quality of the data if you were to curate more images that look like imagenet uh, things will get better uh, and so you can see that basically for example if you take imagenet the 1 million images or you take the full imagenet which is 14 million images 14 million actually does slightly better uh, i would say a lot better versus if you take 14 million completely random images or 1 million completely random images your representation quality is going to be a lot lot poorer i think it's not a two way problem one is the like the pre training side where the architecture the data augmentation everything is overfit the second is the evaluation as well if you take random images and you have lots of cartoons there none of our data sets actually give you credit for rec- being able to recognize cartoons all of the data sets really care about image net top one or they care about like Uh, put recognizing a set of 80 categories or 20 categories which all of them are kind of related to imagenet so we don't get credit for it either uh now if you were to rec- design a task which was actually about i don't know recognizing completely random things in the world so i snap a picture of whatever i just point my phone up in the air i don't care uh and basically get a picture of it maybe these representations will do better uh but right now they don't on the current set of tasks we have this issue of um you know metrics and benchmarks seems to be a big one um if you could imagine a thought experiment imagine if you had an amazing amazon turk and you could have you know i'm going to build this epic system it's like uber for labeling right and you could get all of these human labelers to answer any question for you as part of your distributed training process how would you design the training objective so i would give uh I think it goes back to my notion notion of similarity again this is very much inspired by Alyosha's stuff and like this is also what he called the visual memics uh so the idea is basically is that you pop up two images and you basically say okay how are these two images related how are the objects in these two images related and in what context would they be not related so you pop up two images it's basically like say a zebra and a lion and in what context are they related they are both four legged animals in what context are they not related lots of different ways like the way they appear one is a herbivore one is not so basically and if you get such kind of labeling it's far richer and now you actually are um, encoding a lot of this human knowledge or properties of these objects again a lot of them are not visual properties like you can't really say until you see a lion eating what it is eating whether it's a herbivore or a uh, like carnivore but i think this kind of labeling is far richer because it's less and less tied to particular constructs of the language yeah. of put like say english or an, another language abstract categories happen between things so you say what's the essence between two things and it might be well these two animals have fur they have four legs they both bark so imagine if you could just distribute that out and you there weren't any problems around I mean if you think about it the, the number of comparisons you would make would grow quick very quickly wouldn't it but but if if you could yes. do that would <laughs> do, do you do you think there's there's like a limit to the number of abstract categories or do you think humans can just like you know there's an infinite number I think there's an infinite number I think that's the curse of uh, good thinking or like language because m- combinatorial categories you can come up with whatever you have and I can just add a qualifier yellow and now it is whatever you created yellow yeah. and now it's a new category I mean so I think that's the like in scrabble right the person who adds the s at the end basically just scores points off you I I want to transition a bit more into sort of architectures for for doing self supervised learning you're you're obviously in the, in the vision domain could you lead us a bit through the because there has been quite a bit of evolution and discoveries in the in the last few years uh, that has pushed and pushed the the state of the art in self supervised learning could you lead us a bit through that evolution and sort of maybe the thinking behind each of these improvements so i'm i'm thinking of things like i don't know momentum encoders were used uh contrastive non contrastive whether or not we use projection heads and how important you know, all like what are the the big ideas that have come in the last few years and and why So I can start with something which is slightly independent of this which was just like the pure convnet architecture uh back like I think when all of this started alexnet was the favored architecture even in like up until as recently as 2019 people were actually using alexnet 
And so when we started working at Facebook on self-supervised learning, like when I started uh, joining Facebook, uh, we started using ResNet because, well, it was the architecture that actually made more sense and we could have fairer comparisons to supervise. And basically, there was almost like no work using ResNet at that point for self-supervised learning. People were still using AlexNet, so it was a lot of effort to basically just get ResNets uh, on it and like basically work all, make all the pretext tasks like Jigsaw and so on actually work on ResNets. Uh, I think the other thing was uh, just wider models are better. I think that was a discovery uh, made at uh, Google Brain, if I'm not uh, Same clear v Where like basically, you, yeah, you can basically, not simple clear v This was basically Alexander Kulis, Kuliniskov's bit, work. Bit, bit transfer? Uh, not bit. No, this was, was a CVPR 2019 paper. But it was bit much, it was before bit and so on. But where he basically showed and a bunch of his co-authors basically showed that you can uh, increase the channel width of a ResNet and that actually seems to do really well for self-supervised learning. It was an observation that kind of transferred over to supervised as well. Uh, and then sort of, I think people became far more comfortable training these large models, uh, which was actually good because then we started seeing these really awesome numbers. Because up until then, I think if this hadn't happened, then people would maybe still be using AlexNet or smaller architectures and not really have seen the gains of self-supervised learning. Now coming to like the contrastive part, um, I think contrastive learning, uh, like Simclear basically showed, you can basically do it if you have a lot of GPUs and if you have a large batch size, you can do it without having access to, say, momentum encoders or memory banks and so on. Uh, I think momentum encoders, uh, like they also came out in 2019, uh, they, they're very powerful way, like initially when proposed, they were a very powerful way to sort of uh, get contrastive learning in a small batch size. Whereas more and more what we are seeing, if you look at, uh, if you see, look at uh, Dino, uh, momentum encoders seem to be something which is like a easy or cheap way to create a teacher model. So b basically, if you look at even standard supervised learning, like efficient nets uh, and so on, they use, they train the model, but they maintain the sort of momentum encode, momentum encoder. It's not really used, but at the end, when they're evaluating on image net or something, they use the momentum encoder because they find that that actually does better. So this is like the standard Poliak averaging. Now, the smarter trick of using that in self-supervised learning, or in fact, even in semi-supervised learning, uh, I guess the sort of first method that I saw that was doing it was main teachers, which was doing it for semi-supervised learning, where you have this momentum encoder and that's basically uh, teaching things. I think the reason basically is that optimization is so stochastic. Uh, having this Poliak averaging actually helps you because all the sort of random steps you take in the feature space get averaged out and only the dominant direction really remains. And so... Uh, maybe it's like a bug in our optimization or a feature of the momentum encoder. I'm not sure where to attribute it at. Maybe if we were better at optimizing things, maybe we wouldn't need it. Uh, but yeah, that's what we have right now. And then the projection head idea was really interesting. So when that came out in Simclear, we were super surprised. We are like, how is this small change making such a big difference? And I think as soon as the paper had come out, so I'd actually met uh, Jeff Hinton, I think a couple of weeks before the paper had just come out or a week before the paper had come out. And at that point, he's like, yeah, we have this like really cool method and uh, it's it's doing really well. Of course, he didn't say how well. And when the paper came out, it was doing really well. Uh, and at that point, Perl was the state of the art. So I, I knew exactly how much delta there was. And so as soon as we made the change, it works. I think the intuition was, uh, and at least for me right now still is, the fact that we're not very good at uh, using similarity and our similarity is too fine-grained. So if I basically learned the similarity between this particular cat image and this other random cat, uh, cat image or random crop of the cat image are similar, uh, then that similarity is just too fine-grained to be useful for a broad categorization task. So what we want is basically a separation between the feature that we use for this broad categorization task and basically the feature that is being used for this uh, similarity. And so basically adding more layers there or adding more capacity in that part is very useful. Now, projectors are really big these days, right? So if you look at Barlow Twins or if you look at Dino, the projector actually, if I remember, I'd done this calculation at some point, I think has almost the same number of parameters as the backbone for a ResNet. So you can you can see basically how big that is. Uh, or it, in fact, it actually has slightly larger number of parameters if you look at the even wider projectors. That's telling you basically that that projector is doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Probably a lot of the heavy lifting is happening because that notion of fine-grained similarity, the augmentation that we're doing is not exactly right. And so basically we are telling the projector, hey, you do this particular task, but don't corrupt my feature. This feature that I want to use for ImageNet top one, don't corrupt that. 
So you take all the capacity that you can to do this particular task because I don't know what what's better. Uh, but uh, don't corrupt this later feature for me. Um, so I think that's the sort of reason for projectors. I think the other thing that emerged was probably the objective functions, uh, where basically we find that you can do contrastive, you can do clustering, you can do like self distillation, like in Biol or Dino. You can do like decorrelation. All of them roughly work about the same. Uh, like on certain tasks, one is better on certain tasks, the other is better, which is basically showing that, I mean, what you really want is data augmentation invariance. Uh, and so a lot of the objectives are doing, achieving it in very, very different ways. But every data augmentation is the sort of uh, success there. It, it feels like one of the one of the fundamental things that we're wrestling with here is this notion of mode collapse or we 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 don't want trivial representations we don't want the models to ignore the inputs there have been loads of strategies to try and avoid that C could you give us a bit of a commentary ar around those strategies yeah and that's actually so whenever i like take a class on self supervisor i think that's how i run across models these days i go actually with like this is what we want to do, which is like achieve uh, invariance rate augmentation. And everything basically is just a different way of avoiding this trivial collapse. Uh, so I think, okay, the reason basically this exists is we want to have this notion of similarity. But if everything is similar to ev ev like everything else, then basically we have a trivial solution because we need this notion of dissimilarity or something to basically repel things out. Contrastive learning basically does that in the most straightforward way, uh, where you define positives and negatives. And so positive samples are the augmentations of the same image. Negative is anything else in the image. Very strong assumption, but yeah, works. Uh, and basically, now you train a feature. Clustering basically does that in a different way. It, so if you think about contrastive learning, essentially it is creating these soft clusters in feature space, right? You're saying these two things are similar. Everything else around it is negative. And so you're, you're creating these like tiny, tiny balls. Uh, clustering is a more explicit way of doing it, where you're basically saying all of these groups of samples are related. And all of these other groups of samples are related, and all of these other groups are related, and you're basically latently discovering these clusters as you are training the model. Uh, the other way to view like something like Suave is basically the prototypes or the clusters, uh, rather than saying that you want to uh, exactly make the features of these two crops similar, you want their projections on the prototypes to be similar. So you're basically reducing the problem from being a comparison of these 128 or like 256 float values of like the vector to a sort of distribution over 3000 things. So it's just a projection and this basis function that you have, the prototypes are also being learned automatically. And of course, now because these basis functions uh, are sort of, you can have assignment to them, these can be interpreted as clusters. Um, then for something like self distillation I think that's the sort of most uh, curious part for me. Like Biol is that example where you have a momentum encoder and this. The fact that it doesn't collapse, it was really hard for us to believe. Like when it came out, I remember a lot of us were scratching our heads. There was like a, a big discussion on what's really going on and why is it not working? And then uh, Yongdong Tian, who is another research scientist at uh, FAIR, he has this paper on like explaining why this happens. And one of his intuitions at that point was basically that the model averaging is uh, serving as basically something where when you average this model weight across uh, a bunch of perturbations it's really capturing the exact signal that's necessary and he has like a, a bunch of maths showing why this is necessary like why this happens um for me that part is still a bit unclear this idea of having because you know we started off with let's say siamese networks and then we started having this concept of an asymmetry and momentum encoding and things like stop gradients and stuff like that can, can you give us a bit more info on that yeah yeah so Okay, so the Siamese network architecture is what is probably most typical in the like, contrastive learning. When MoCo was introduced, it was asymmetric because of the momentum encoder, but the momentum encoder was not introduced for collapse. It was really introduced for efficiency because you could have that sort of large batch, uh, large batch size by having the queue. So the reason was not collapse there. It was actually just efficiency. Now, basically with these sort of uh, stop gradients, what people have figured out is if you were to just optimize the two branches exactly identically with the exact notion of similarity and no repelling term. So contrast learning does not suffer from this, but every other thing does have that issue. Once you exactly introduce that, then the no, like the representation is completely going to collapse. There is nothing repelling things out. So now you basically try to do these tricks like asymmetric optimization. So if you have something like SimSiam, 
where you block the gradient into one branch and you have another projector over here. So now the architecture itself is slightly different in the two branches and both of them are basically not being updated at the same time. Uh, or WinBuel, where you have again asymmetry in the architecture because of the momentum encoder and a projector on like the left part, which the momentum encoder does not have. And again, basically the update rule is very different. So I actually did believe for a long time that maybe this asymmetry is probably necessary as soon as you remove the repairing term. Uh, but like in Barlow Twins, we were very like uh, surprised that you really don't even need this kind of asymmetry. As long as the objective function is has some notion of trying to prevent collapse. Uh, so in this case, decorrelation uh, with centered on centered vectors actually uh, does not collapse. Uh, you don't really need the asymmetry. So it just turns out that we are basically trying to solve a problem that we created ourselves, which was basically that we want the data. We the only thing we know is similarity, and the only thing we can optimize for is similarity. Uh, so contrasted learning makes the strong assumption that everything else is dissimilar. Of course, I mean that's not true. Uh, and so the other works are basically trying to remove that uh, sort of assumption of dissimilarity, but then have this additional problem of collapse. Uh, but I think now more and more it is fairly well understood. There are more papers coming out which are actually studying this in far amount of detail. New objective functions, uh, even like follow-ups to Barlow twins, which are showing that you can actually have even simpler objective functions that do not collapse with like completely symmetric Siamese networks optimized in the same exact way with the exact same architecture. So there is a hidden notion of dissimilarity in all of these methods uh, to prevent basically the collapse. But I believe the assumption is not as strong as contrast field learning. Contrast field learning just makes this like extremely strong assumption. Yeah, in Dino though, there are two things that we just discussed. There's top gradient. There's also a momentum updated teacher, right? So what was the motivation behind doing that? Because we just discussed having a momentum updated teacher network is probably also one of the ingredients for you know preventing the collapse and on the other hand stop gradient is also one of the elements to do that so what was the motivation as soon as you have this like momentum encoded like momentum teacher uh, it's not updated but i mean you automatically have a stop gradient right that comes essentially for free with it because that part is not really updated with it ah i so, see yeah. So as soon as you introduce that, it's basically something you're kind of getting for free. You're introducing an asymmetry not only in the architecture, but also in the optimization because that particular branch will never actually get updated. The motivation was really that momentum teachers create, like if you see there's a nice curve in the Dino paper where like basically the momentum teacher always has slightly better accuracy than the current model. So you're basically playing like a catch-up game. So in a cheap way, you generate a teacher online and that teacher tells you what a better thing to do is and essentially you're playing catch-up, catch-up, catch-up and then finally at the end of the training, both these models converge. Imagine you're, I'm, I'm a caveman. I don't know anything about deep learning. Um, it just seems bizarre that let's say you have a teacher network and it's not being updated and like it's it's weights are just some exponentially moving average of this other thing over there, but the other thing's learning from the teacher. It just seems bizarre. Uh, how does that even work? <laughs> yeah, it is extremely bizarre. I I think it's like what I said. I think it's a bug of our optimization uh, right now that we don't really know. But when we do SGD, like this stochastic optimization, we are taking these random gradient steps. Now, a lot of the, these steps have a lot of noise. So what you can think of is the like when you take that moving average of the weights, you're essentially culling away all the noise. You're culling away all the random steps that you took, which were not really necessary. So in that sense, if you think about it, the moving average of the weights is probably going to be a, like, a better solution than what you have right now. Because right now, the current solution that you have is a result of all those random mistakes that you made in the optimization or the, all the random steps that you took in this large sort of uh, like non-linear function space. Whereas the momentum uh, updated weights have kind of, because of that momentum, have kind of cancelled away those mistakes. And so they're likely to be a better uh, function they're, they're going to be a better, better functional representation of your data so when i think about contrastive learning i i initially always think of you know where where to vec and things like this essentially where it sort of came from quote unquote right now vision has pushed so much beyond what where to vec did partly because of the architectures but partly because of the the augmentations now in um in language it's a bit more tricky right because we have these sort of discrete objects the words and so on 
do you have i know you're in vision but do you have an intuition of what could uh, nlp learn from computer vision that is is currently not being explored because this the type of you know that this type of of learning has almost faded away a little bit in favor of of, of generative pre-training and so on so i think the mlm objective is the sort of main competitor right to contrastive mm -hmm. learning the mass language modeling uh, i think NLP has this nice, so if you think about contrastive learning versus like MLM based objectives, the main difference you can think of is maybe the fact that you have a parametric softmax and a non-parametric softmax, uh, where in the sort of mass language model, you have a set categories, you would know the exact vocabulary that you have, and all you're doing is computing a softmax over those. In contrast, if the a set of objects that you compute the softmax over is changing, that's dynamically changing as your data changes. Uh, so yes, I mean, I think if you know the exact vocabulary of things that you're optimizing for, it completely makes sense to basically use the kind of uh, objective that they have. Why go through all the trouble of like having this like moving set of objects that you're com computing a distribution over? Uh, but I do think the power of contrastive learning is basically uh, its simplicity, right? You are not making assumptions of what are the words I'm going to mask out, how many percentage of the times I'm going to mask out. You can think of them as being data augmentations, uh, but all these data augmentations are not affecting the output, right? So for example, in, in BERT, they affect the output exactly. They You create a mask over here and then the model is supposed to predict things over there. So I do think that the fact that all of the uh, inductive bias basically goes into the input side of it and the feature kind of remains unchanged, uh, like you don't really perturb the feature as much, you don't change the prediction problem as much. Uh, it just seems uh, cleaner to me, but of course I'm biased coming from vision. Uh, but I do think this way of doing contrastive learning is probably very useful for uh, NLP as well, especially the fact that you can align modalities. So for example, now like the recent work we did where we were aligning video features and audio features. Uh, so you have like a video encoder and an audio encoder and you do contrastive learning between these two. So now these two encoders are completely different and like audio signals look very, very different from video signals but you're able to use contrastive learning in such a general way to be able to align these two modalities. And I think in language, basically, like Clip does the same thing, right? Image with, with text is contrastive. The same thing I think happens with NLP, where if you have two very different things that you're trying to align, language, for example, two languages that actually have no linguistic similarity at all, uh, and you're trying to basically relate these two languages, maybe contrastive learning is possibly the way to sort of create this universal embedding of all languages. Yeah, and we actually um, spoke to the folks from FAIR who are doing the, the unsupervised uh, language translation for programming languages. But um, that reminded me of something you said to us uh, before the show, Ishan, which was that you had this really interesting example of um, with video, you might have lots of different images of trains, but they don't generalize to go together very well. But train noises do. So when you have this multimodal um, form of learning actually you can we can kind of create this level of generalization through a category in the other domain of, of data but just before we get to that let's put a, a mental hold on that there was a really nice segue after Yannick's question which is you know you, you wrote this dark matter paper with Yann Nakun and we're all signed on self-supervised learning is brilliant but you there was this wonderful figure do you remember where it said there was this dimension of um dimensionality yes. um discrete versus continuous and, and uncertainty and and of course as you were just saying a minute ago the interesting thing about these discrete language models is that well you know you can actually have a computable softmax of uncertainty but it's completely different in the vision world and, and the paper was signposting that there might potentially be somewhere else we could go these so-called latent predictive models could could you give us a, a a little piece on that right the fundamental problem is basically if you were to design even a mass language prediction kind of objective for vision it's really hard because future prediction is so uncertain if we were so good at future prediction even as humans then all of there would be no stock market we would basically have predicted everything uh, so i think it's just that fact that if you have like these sort of signals uh, which are so complicated, it's very hard for us to be able to predict all the things because it's a very high dimensional space. What latent variable models help us do is basically you can capture all the uncertainty inside the latent variable. So this allows this model to basically, so you, let's just think from a like non-mathematical sense, just from like a pure like engineering workflow, right? You're designing a system that takes as an input and what you want this model to do is create a prediction. It's a deterministic function. So of course, given a single input, it's going to produce a single output. 
But, and of course, we don't want that because, well, I mean, there are so many possible futures. What is one way of doing it? Well, you introduce a input that is basically stochastic because that's like because our model weights are not stochastic; they are deterministic. So that's basically what you're doing. You're introducing a latent variable such that this model, which is completely deterministic, can actually now basically predict multiple things and basically have multiple different types of output. And why do these multiple types of output exist? Well, because of real uncertainty in the world, which means that the stochastic input that you're sending to the model is capturing that uncertainty. Uh, so that latent variable is really capturing the uncertainty in the world in terms of its prediction. In, in the article, you said there was some issue about limiting the domain of that latent variable. Is that the blocker, right? Yes. Yes. So how are we going to do it's that? Limiting the domain of it, uh, also limiting the power of it. Because if the latent variable is really large, uh, if it's like super high capacity, then I can essentially, like the model doesn't need to learn anything because the latent variable in itself, like that big monolithic vector can capture everything. But if the latent variable is too small, then the model doesn't even have, like it. if the, the uncertainty in the prediction is very large, then that latent variable is not powerful enough to represent it. So there's this like trade-off. And right now, I think because of the models we have, our latent variables are of a fixed size, right? We can't really have, like depending on the input, we can't have different sized latent variables. But I do believe that in the future, maybe if we can come up with models that are not averse to taking multi-sized inputs or like have some notion of basically being able to say, so if you see a person like a hand moving like this, you're fairly certain where it's going to go next because there is a like the prediction error is very low or the uncertainty is very low. Whereas for certain types of predictions, the uncertainty is going to be very high. And in that case, you really need that large latent variable. And if the models are actually able to figure this out, and possibly like basically adjust the size of the latent representation that they're using or the amount of like uh, how amount they're relying on it, then that's actually going to solve everything. I just don't think we are there yet. We don't have any models that can do that yet. Okay, well, um, quick fire question then. Dr. Kilcher over here, he made a comment. Um, I, I hope Jan's watching this, by the way. Hello, Jan. Uh, he made a comment about energy-based models saying that they're, they're just a loss function and they can be applied anywhere. And why do we need them? And personally, I, I, I love them. I mean, I, I think they, they, they give a real, what well, let's say a diagrammatic calculus to understand machine learning models. And I actually think they, they articulate um, uh, concepts visually in, in a way that I really like. But completely honest uh, answer. Don't worry that you're working for Jan. What do you think about energy-based models? I have to interject yeah. here that I got yelled at <laughs> And I Did now you? understand that the, at least the distinction. Okay, sorry. It's the, the, the energy you minimize at inference time while the loss you minimize at training time. Yes. Oh, yes. okay. So it's still the same. No. <laughs> <laughs> Ishan, sorry, you, yeah. you love energy-based models. So give us the elevator pitch. <laughs> I don't think I love them. I, I, I mean, love is a very strong word. Uh, but anyway, I really like them. So I was introduced to them by Jan also in about 2019, 2020, when he basically like, actually, I sat down with him for one hour and I'm like, you keep saying this, can you explain it to me? Because I don't, I don't quite get it. So I think the, it's a very nice formulation to explain most of the current models that we have. It's a very nice abstraction to explain that. The thing is, if you just uh, think about models in like, without like thinking about the energy or without thinking about the loss that they're minimizing or like the manifold that ha that's happening or latent variables, it's very hard. You may like think that uh, BAEs are very different from contrastive learning, are very different from GANs, whereas this sort of a framework is just really nice. It unifies everything. It provides a single way of doing these things. There are only small components of these that are actually different at a conceptual level. And these small components are different because they're trying to achieve the same thing, but in a slightly different way. I, I think it's the same analogy as saying basically that all the con like all the self-supervised vision methods are roughly the same. They're all trying to achieve this notion of like invariant state augmentations and small things change. Like, oh, is it asymmetric? Is it like asymmetric optimization architecture? I think if you were to take that even a step more like above in terms of abstraction, energy-based models are, I think, the sort of more natural way of thinking about it. Uh, because that really helps you think about all of these different types of models. You know, it's it's nice to have a formulation that that unify a lot of these models and approaches. Is there something that has emerged out of that that sort sort of an architecture maybe one of you that was inspired by thinking in this way that you wouldn't have gotten, you know, by simply going through the the deep learning hacker way? So, you know, where where does this lead 
to that is a is a, a good place uh, so a few of them so i think like we have played around with a lot of architectures uh, like internally and we figured out that there are very small things that actually matter we, once you think about it like it in this framework there are small things that matter and like large differences that seem to create boundaries between these methods don't matter as much so for example like even in, recently we've been working on like self supervised learning for 3d uh, self supervised learning for video a lot of the like the energy based models ideas uh, in terms of like why contrastive learning should work are the reason where we felt super confident that okay when we apply these models to even a completely different uh, domain these things should work really well uh, barlow twins in some part was actually kind of inspired by energy based models as well because like the initial experimentation that actually went into designing that model looked very different uh, like it was trying to achieve something very different it ended up like through uh, whatever a trajectory ended up becoming barlow twins so you don't see that like uh, energy based models there explicitly but that's exactly where it started where we're trying to like come up with uh, so yuri and folks i actually got involved in the project much later and so i know it's linear somewhat but initially the folks were really trying to like learn sparse dictionaries and like these sparse dictionaries would have like a latent variable component so basically they could figure out like how the dictionary is going to get modified based on samples and so on and that slowly basically led them to bugwins amazing well um th the other two papers i wanted to, just to touch on really quickly um you was, you were saying about uh, depth contrast which is um you know point clouds i'm really interested in geometric deep learning we we've got a special edition with taco cohen actually in in a couple of weeks so we're yes. going to go go over to amsterdam to speak to taco but <clears throat> there was that and there was also avid which was you know the the audio visual paper so what what are the main lessons and uh, that you learned there and how did you approach it yeah so lineage wise i think avid was before so i'll talk about avid earlier so <clears throat> avid the main idea was at and this point basically contrastive learning was not as accepted as it is now this was in 2019 and so at that point we basically thought that okay how about we want to learn features from video and what we found is video has a lot of redundant information so one frame is basically roughly the same as the next one is roughly the same as the next one it's very hard to tell what is salient what is the thing to focus on and there has been work in the past uh, from like andrew owens at uh, mit and berkeley uh very basically showed that using audio signals can actually help figure out what is salient in the video and so we basically were really inspired by this and what we did is just trained a model to just align the two modalities just have two encoders uh that basically predict features and this align them what ends up really happening is on very unexpected categories you get like very powerful visual features for example if you're trying to figure out whether someone is cutting an onion or cutting an apple it's hard to tell basically if the video is pixelated but from the audio it's very clear onions have like the skin which makes a very like different sound uh, apples are like you know if it's a crisp apple it will make a very different kind of a sound um trains for example are very different and so on so what we ended up seeing is basically if you look at correlations between these two modalities you're actually able to get a better sense of what things go together or a better sense of visual similarity actually uh, for example like a fire truck sounds very similar to a train but visually they don't look very similar Uh, so if you look at agreement basically in both spaces you actually get the clusters or the kinds of groupings that you discover about videos are actually far better and so that's basically i would say the main yeah. observation in avid and we also improve the contrastive loss function just on that though is the magic that it's it's more than the sum of its parts there's some yes. there's some interaction between those two modalities that produces something really special yes so it's the uh, it's a interaction basically between looking at I mean it's what we did was I would say fairly like uh, I would say not as advanced interaction it's basically just looking at similarities between uh, in these two feature spaces and then just finding correlations between that so these two samples are similar in the video space these two samples are similar in the audio space are they also similar and so basically now they should basically form a cycle or basically be similar together so I think that's the sort of thing that emerges because pure visual similarity may not be that useful or may not be as clear in a lot of cases um uh, videos can be pixelated things are just moving too quickly so you can't see it um and so on so audio similarity really helps you but of course audio similarity is not just things that sound similar don't always work the same way or may, we don't call it the same way we are visual beings primarily so we categorize things visually so of course visual similarity is the primary uh, driver and the um the depth contrast So depth contrast was surprising. Uh so this was with an intern uh, last year and so the intern was actually a 3D expert he's done like a lot of work on 3D recognition 3D detection models and so on. Uh not so much in self supervised learning. And 
So when you starting, I basically said, how about we take your 3D architecture and we basically just try like the simplest thing. Just take like depth maps and we just like do contrast learning. He's like, it won't work. It just won't work. Uh, point clouds are very different from images and video. It, they're not like regular grids. It's just not going to work. There is no reason basically uh, the like the point architectures, point net plus plus or whatever models that we use have the same inductive biases as like a continent. Uh, point net plus plus, if I don't know how, how familiar you are with it, but it's a very strange model. And I spent a lot of time actually scratching my head over it as well, like understanding what is this architecture trying to do. And I still don't understand it quite well. Uh, and basically to our disbelief or to basically our luck, uh, it worked really well doing contrasted learning there. So what we basically showed is you can take any type of point cloud. It can be LiDAR, it can be indoor, it can be single view, it can be multi-view, it doesn't matter. You can just basically apply uh, contrasted learning. And of course, we designed like the right data augmentations for it, right data augmentations. And uh, that seems to work really well. So it's a very simple way. Uh, and pre-training is not common in 3D. So this would be like one of the few papers that's actually showing that pre-training is possible in 3D. And pre-training not being common in 3D is basically like a symptom of we don't really have very large, good annotated 3D data sets. There's no imaginative people in there. Amazing. Well, we've we've come up to the to the end of the show. So um I know, Dr. Ishan Mizra, thank you so much. It's been an absolute honor. Honestly, a really great conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks a lot for having me, everyone. Amazing. And thank and you. any researchers who are super talented, presumably hand your CVs over to Facebook Research. <laughs> yes. How, how, how's it? How's it going at Facebook Research? It, presumably, it's a. It must be a really cool place to work at. It's it's really good. Uh, I think so I interned here before, like joining full time. And in my internship, I think basically, I think in the second month, I'm like, yep, this is where I want to be. Please hire me. Yeah, living yeah. the dream, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Cool. 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 Really hope you've enjoyed the episode, folks. We've had so much fun making it. Remember to join us next week for a special edition with Dr. Taco Cohen from Qualcomm. We're going to be talking about his exciting and newly released PhD thesis on equivariant convolutional neural networks. See you then. <laughs>